chat and tell us why did you decide to join this call today? So one sentence, just quick, why did you decide? What was it about this invitation? Is it because you've known Colin? Um, and Colin is going to say... Yeah. <laughs> So, and send your message to everyone when you choose who to send it to send it to everybody so um gail sturger says i'm here because leadership has changed significantly over the years and i'd like to keep up to date with modern leadership development thanks gail that's fabulous context um natasha says i, I appreciate what colin does and how genuine he is in his interactions and so that's why she came Dane, I need to charge my battery. Dane, your battery will be charged. Dane is from Emergent Energy. He's one of our, our member of our community, important member of our community. Nicole, important to learn from leaders, lovely, but he's willing to share, sharing ideas of the evolving. So we're going to have a look at that. Thanks, Pam. Pam says, I need, I love symphonian webinars and just um, come here for inspiration. Uh, Jackie, I love the name of the topic and I love spaces to learn and grow. So lots of wonderful, wonderful people on this call. Mm. I'm going to keep an eye, going to go back to that, that um, chat in a minute. Uh, so please keep sharing. Okay, Colin is going to keep, uh, have, keep an eye on that. I want to quickly tell you how I know Colin Hall. And some of you have heard the story. Um, but about in 1993, 28 years ago, the other day I was struggling to remember how many years ago, 28 years ago, I was a lowly project manager at TrueWorks and Colin was Mr. Most Important Chairman of the Wiltshire Group. But I hadn't spent, at that time, I hadn't spent lots of time in corporate. So I didn't know that he was the uber leader that we all had, had to bow in front of. And he didn't come across to me as, as that because I saw him, he came to speak at a, a, a um, course that we did at the GSB, at the Graduate School of Business, Business, and it was the Retail Development course. And Colin was asked to come and speak about leadership. And I fell madly in love with this guy at the front of the room. And he was talking, <laughs> I remember one of the things that he talked about was Colin, you might not remember, but you were talking about the, the difference between your real self and your corporate self and how, how much energy it takes when, when it, we can't be ourselves at, at work and we can't be authentic. And for me, that's always been a hot topic. So anyway, I kind of, I thought, I want to hang out with this. This is a man I want to get to know better. And I didn't realize that there were rules and regulations around who can talk to who. And, you know, so I, um, a few weeks later, I got an invitation to say that the Mind walk, the full mind walk was going to show at the lobby. And I thought, well, that sounds fabulous. And I want to invite Colin to go to the lobby with me. So I went to his office. He was on the you know top floor. And I said to his um, PA, I, I want to invite Colin to go to the movies with me. Um, and she somehow the message got to Colin. I can't remember how. But it shouldn't surprise you that a few weeks later, I was on the red carpet, because how dare you speak directly to the chairman? And um, I almost lost my job as a result of that. But that experience gave me a sense of the man that Colin is. And since then, I've, I've often written about Colin when I write about how have I kind of kept going over the last 10 years, Colin's names got, came up. And there are a few stories in our latest book um, about Colin uh, showing up in, in, at a time when life was a bit tough for me. So that's Colin. Now, Colin, I don't know, I was kind of, I, I was thinking I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you, what is your memory of that evening at the lobby? Was, well, it just of, that kind of, I mean, the, the extraordinary thing was that I saw no, no problem of etiquette or convention or anything and you inviting me we were sharing an interest and certainly mind walk was a really good movie to share but more than that what it told me and it's not the only story but what it's told me is that if you don't grasp opportunities <laughs> you don't get relationships if you don't start with a warm greeting if you don't start with an interesting bit of learning and listening then you don't have the privilege of it 28-year-old relationship that has brought us to where we are right here this morning, uh, sharing the joy of a, of a learning journey. So I just can't understand why people are so fussy 
about who you should greet and who you shouldn't greet and who you should go to the lobby with and who you shouldn't. I mean, it was a completely um, above board, if that's the right word, <laughs> gesture on your part to share something of interest with somebody that you thought would be interested. How more simple and sensible can it be than that? So I've always had a very sensible relationship with you. Mm -hmm. Lovely, sensible relationship with you. And uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to take it another step. So thank you, Colin. And thank you for everybody sharing their thoughts on the chat. Please keep sharing your thoughts with a, with a group this size. There's probably not going to be lots of opportunity for interaction, although we, we will kind of try and have um, the last half hour or so be more interactive. But in the meantime, please share your thoughts. If Colin says something that kind of resonates with you or I say something or someone else, please just keep the conversation going. It's just wonderful. Also afterwards, Pete, um, we'll, we'll give Colin a copy of the chat and he will um, be able to, to make contact with you if there's anything that you want him to make contact with. So the, the, way, the reason for today's session is a little while ago, I received a, a, an email from Colin Knight. Colin and I agreed that we're not going to plan today's session. We're going to we're going to imp improvise and we're going to ad lib and we're going to just kind of share our story of the last few years. And there's lots and lots of learning in that. But anyway, a few years, a few weeks ago, months ago, probably now, um, Colin sent me a note, and this is what his note said. It said, it said a great friend asked me a provocative question recently. What would you do differently if you were appointed CEO of a large company today? It really made me think and pull together all I've learned since I retired from the Wiltu Group 20 years ago and then what COVID has taught me in the last year. I would love to share my response with you. Um, and I'd love to see you and would value your response. So anyway, that led to a conversation and I said to Peter, to Colin, I've had lots of opportunities to have these kind of cups of, cups of coffee with, with Colin but I don't want to just hold it for myself anymore. And so Colin and I are having a virtual cup of coffee today in the presence of an amazing group of people. And we hope that you will contrib contribute to this cup of coffee so that it gets even more interesting. And um, the intention, as, as um, we heard earlier, the intention is definitely for all of our cups to be filled um, and for us to, to have a new perspective on leadership. So, so this is the, the big outcome from today is to think about leadership differently. And we're going to kind of be on a journey with Colin. So Colin, many years ago, I, can't remember, I don't know how many years ago, you were a hotshot manager at one of the big organizations. You can choose what you want to share. Um, and you thought of leadership in a particular way. And at that time, I'm kind of wondering whether if, if, whether if a lowly project manager at that time contacted you for coffee, whether you wouldn't have been too important. You know, this is now 40 years ago. Just, just talk to us about how did you think about leadership and, or management and the role of the leader and where do leaders fit and other people and you know, that, that whole story about leadership that has since changed, but where did you start your journey? Well, I, very simply, I started my journey on the ground floor of a seven story business building in Johannesburg belonging to South African breweries. And as far as I was concerned, leadership was about the seventh floor. <laughs> but it was as simple as that. You had to get to the top to become a leader. And I can remember playing the stupid game of um, <laughs> bluffing other people. When I got into the lift on the ground floor at uh, it was called Textile House for whatever reason. And there we would all get into quite a big lift, I suppose 14 or 15 people, which you wouldn't be allowed to do today. But we'd all get in there and one would push number one and another would push number two and two would push number three and Colin would push number seven. <laughs> and I remember the response, the subtle, quiet response of other people in the lift. Who the hell is this young guy? who's going up to the seventh floor where the leadership sits. Now, suffice to say, I was the last one in the lift when we passed number six. When I got out at number seven, I couldn't wait to either go to the toilet because that's the quickest way out of trouble or get onto the fire escape and go down to the sixth and the fifth and the fourth and the third and the second and down to the ground floor <laughs> where I belong. But in those days, there was absolutely no doubt in people's mind 
that the leader sat at the top of what I like to call a power pyramid. I do it like this, it's a power pyramid. And there at the top was the leadership. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't even a half a decision. I wanted to be there. And what I was learning was how do you get there? And why I wanted to be there was for two reasons. Firstly, because then I would be able to see further because that goes with the seventh floor. If you're on the seventh <laughs> floor or on the top of a mountain, you can see further than anybody on the fifth floor or at the bottom of the mountain. So I wanted to see as how high I could get because I wanted to see how far I could see. The second reason why I liked the idea of getting to the top was because once you've decided where you're going, you tell your men, and in those days it was largely men, and certainly at SA Breweries it was largely men, you tell them to follow you or else. <laughs> so that's where we're going, guys, and that's where you're coming. So my picture was absolutely clear. It was you get to the top of the pyramid where you can see furthest and where you, once you've decided where we're going, you can frankly make people come with you whether they like it or not. So that's why I liked SA Breweries particularly because not only was it a good place to learn with the seven story building, but it was also a monopoly. Now, believe me, when you work in a monopoly, it's an amazing power situation because you can not only tell your staff and the people around you what they have to do, but you can actually tell the customer too. <laughs> he has to drink your beer whether he likes it or not. Uh, so that was really the start, <laughs> Louise, and that's why I was what I was. I was a champion seventh floor um, man <clears throat> heading for the seventh floor. And then you ended up, did you, you ended up in this, on the seventh floor, didn't you? Yes. I mean, <laughs> it was crazy because, I mean, it didn't take me long to work out how to get there. You get there in two ways. The first is that you make an impression on the guys at the top. Now they don't see you on the ground floor. So you have to find a way to make an impression. And there were ways that I did that. And the second thing was that, that um, I found it easy to make people do what I wanted them to do. I don't think I was a nasty autocratic person, but I was quite firm. And um, it wasn't long before I was um, on the way. And one of the things that I did, which was me being intelligent, I think, was that in 1961, which was when I joined, for the first time, the black population of South Africa was allowed to drink legally. Previous to that, it was prohibition for black people. Now that meant a huge change in our market opportunity. Now I'm not stupid. I mean, when, you're on, when you've got new customers, you go and meet them, right? And I met them in Shabins. And I went to Shabins often, but I mean often, 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 often. And you don't go to Shabins at 11 in the morning, you go to Shabins at 11 at night. So I became friends with black beer drinkers. And I was the only white guy in SA breweries who ever drank a beer with a black man, particularly in a Shabin. Well, that gives you a sense of authority. So it wasn't long before I climbed the ladder and I became a main board director when I was 28, 28 and a bit. So that was unusual in a big business like SAB. In fact, in any big business at the time. So I was a classic leader. What was interesting was at that time too, and I'm talking too much, but you can stop me, was that there was very little difference in the perception of a manager and a leader. Managers of departments called themselves leaders quietly. Um, the management of the trade unions were all leaders. There wasn't anybody in a trade union who didn't call himself a leader. So there was a very hazy difference between managing and leading at that time. And uh, I think that leaders were just managers dressed up, actually. I think that, and I think that the management courses were teaching people that were teaching leadership, were actually teaching management. So there was a, there was a confusion between the management function and the leadership function. It took a while for me to sort that out in my mind. <laughs> so that was my thought. Classic, classic pyramid climber.
Okay, so there you were, top of the pyramid, important man, and winning. And winning was important for you at the time. Now, your story about the seventh floor reminds me that a while ago, or when, a few years ago, when, when we were in that kind of middle of lots of um, uh, power shutdowns and we didn't have generators, etc. I went to one of these organizations where the leaders were sitting at the seventh floor and suddenly they all moved to the first floor. Because it wasn't yeah. so convenient to be on the seventh floor if you have to walk all the way to the seventh floor. That, that was a disadvantage. <laughs> and then, there were lots of yeah. And then two competitors came to take on the SA Brewery Monopoly. The one was Whitbreads from England and uh, we ended up buying their brewery for a song because they, they didn't know how to beat us because we were too horrible, actually. We were too tough. And then there was a South African by the name of Louis Late, who was an amazing man. <laughs> he knew a lot about fertilizer, but he didn't know so much about beer. And we laid traps for him, to be perfectly honest. And he fell into every single one of them. It was, it was almost like a game. I hate to say it a bit like a Monopoly game, but maybe you'll ask me to talk about that too. Anyway. I'm going to ask you to tell, it, tell us about that. So, so Colin, there you were, important man, had to do important things like go to drink beer with the black people. And, the, and you had a, a son who needed your attention, but it, wasn't gonna, it was going to be um, uh, at your, on your terms. And he yeah. asked you to play Monopoly. And he's on this call today. So I'm kind of wondering... Well, maybe we should ask him to tell his version of the story, but we won't do that now. We'll do that some other time. So, so tell us about playing Monopoly with your son as a very you know, important essay. Steve, brewery. my son, was then nine, and I went home earlier than usual, and he was surprised to see me, I think. And he said, hey, Dad, shall we have a game? And it was raining, so we had to choose a game inside. And I said to him, sure, let's play. You choose the game. And of all stupid things, he chose Monopoly. Now, I say stupid, and he's sitting listening. But it was... is, 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 is not, we're not seeing his face. Steve, I want to see your face while your dad's telling the story. Okay. Anyway, so I must tell you, and again, when I talk in front of anybody, whether it's you, Louise, or Steve, for that matter, I feel a real bastard when I talk about it because I had no intention whatever of beating him, I intended to thrash him. Because thrashing was the only game I knew. And when you're in a monopoly, you don't beat people, you thrash them. So in order to thrash him, I did two clever things. I offered warmly, and so nice. Steve, would you like me to run the bank? Yes, Dad, because what does he want to run the bank for? But he didn't realize that the bank has a value. And then I changed the rules and I didn't tell him. And that's cheating. It's as simple as that. So I cheated. And I cheated effectively. And I'm not going to tell you how I did it because some of you might be tempted to play Monopoly the same dirty way. But to suffice to say that it wasn't long before I had all his cash. And he had little pieces of paper with IOU written on them. So I, I was dominantly in the cash position, but he was doing pretty damn well in the pieces of paper. And then he landed on one of my properties, which had a hotel on it, which he had financed with his cash, my little pieces of paper, and he didn't have enough money to pay. So he said to me, I think I better go to the bank. Well, who's the bank? <laughs> I'm the bank. So I said to him, and I'll never forget it. I said to him, Steve, Banks don't lend to nine-year-olds. <laughs> and I've since had reason to understand that banks don't lend it to you when you're 80-something either. But anyway, that was a long story. So he said to me, then, can I swap some of these pieces of paper? And I said to him, no, you can't because the date on them is tomorrow's date. Now, that's nonsense, of course. There was a discount if he'd known about it, there would have been a discount. But I'd given him premium after premium after premium, and I'd given him discount after discount after discount. But it didn't matter to me because it was all bits and pieces of paper. I just wanted his cash. So I thrashed him. I didn't beat him. I absolutely thrashed him. And then the family rule is that the loser puts the game away. Well, that with Monopoly is a pain. You have to fold and put the notes together and put rubber bands on them and all that. 
And while he was doing it, his head was shaking. I'll never forget because he, he really didn't see that I had been a, a cheat. And I'd been charming. And then suddenly he must have hit him. And he turned to me and he looked me straight in the eye and I'll never forget it. And he said to me, Dad, isn't this a game? And what I heard him say was, isn't life a game? Do you have to play it as if it was a war? And I was sick in the toilet with, with my own sense of horror. I resigned from South African breweries because I knew that I was in the wrong place, learning the wrong tricks. And I went out to try and find a better way to live life as a game and not as a war. And that's the difference between where I was and where I started to become. So I've just, I've been, I, I was naughty. I made a, a spotlet Steve, because I do want, I, and this isn't again completely unplanned, but just the fact that we've got both of you in the same conversation. Steve, can you remember that game? Because it had a significant impact on your dad. It changed his life, I think. Uh, Louise, I do. Uh, sorry, uh, good afternoon to everybody out there, or morning. I think it is still in South Africa anyway. Uh, yeah, I've never played Monopoly ever since. Um, <laughs> it did have a profound impact on me in that I knew that that was definitely not the game that I enjoyed. Uh, it is never nice to feel thrashed, even though it is by somebody who was very charming and remains very charming. And it's so interesting, I've seen from uh, uh, Intersent that there's a question to, to ask, is cheating a leadership skill? And I think it, Intersent, I think it's a leadership trap. Um, you know, I think that sometimes the, which I'm sure Colin will speak about, but um, it, it is so tempting because one has the power and one has necessarily the authority and one has the trust of people at the time in those leadership positions that it's sometimes quite tempting to cheat, to cut corners. Uh, and so I don't think it's a leadership skill, although it's not my place to answer your question, but it's very much potentially a trap that we could fall into. Uh, yeah. To maintain an ego. But yeah, so to answer your question, Louise, I, I do remember the day. Um, uh, luckily, the relationship became more important than the outcome. And, uh, and I think that was also a fabulous learning for both of us, that um, the transaction is never to be replaced by the importance of the relationship. And it made me realize, Steve, so I've often heard your dad talk about his relationship with you and how that kind of impacted him. And then I got to know you. And just for everybody who's listening, Steve has just written a book. Uh, that you should, Steve, can you hold it up? That you should all read because it is really important. Do you have it with you, Steve? It's, it's called Another Set of I'll Lenses and it is definitely worth reading. And uh, if you, and I remember uh, many years ago when I first, when, when, when Colin started to run these workshops and he was talking about these six pictures and now you've turned it into a book. So um, there will be a session with Steve um, is the 21st of May, Steve, I can't remember the day, but somewhere later in May, we are having an entire work session like this with just with Steve about his new book. So, and if you want to get the most out of that session, which I'm hoping you're all going to join, um, please, do, please read the book in the meantime. You can't get it. I don't think we can get it in hard copy yet, Steve, but we can download it on Kindle. Yeah, absolutely, Louise. Yeah, thank you for that plug. Um, and uh, <laughs> this was a very spontaneous <laughs> session, so I wasn't expecting that at all. But it'll be delightful to to chat through those ideas uh, on the 21st of May. Um, I'll nip down just now and get the book, which is downstairs. It is the only book uh, in South Africa at the moment, I believe, because it's still only available on Kindle and Amazon. Steve, uh, I got five. Steve, I got five more this morning. Oh, did you? Did you? Yeah, I can bring them. So do yeah. you have a copy? Can you share the copy? Anyway, it's called Steve. I don't have it with, yeah, but I've got them in the house. Yeah. It's called. It's called. Just people are asking what it's called. It's called another set of lenses, um, and very simply, it's about how do our paradigms and perceptions shape our own stories? Um, do we have different lenses through which to see the world? Or, as no doubt um, Dad will talk about today, was it only a lens of power and authority? Or was there also this lens of energy and influence? Uh, and we only have one set of options to choose from. 
And so it is illustrated by a whole bunch of stories of real life people, not only the Mandelas and the Gandhis who are quite hard acts to follow when it comes to leadership and humanity, but of the everyday people who have this ability to see life through another set of lenses and in so doing, they open up the options of different behaviors and very different outcomes. And so that's in, in essence what it's about, but it's called another, another set of lenses. I'll, I'll look downstairs shortly and, uh, and grab a cup. I don't Fantastic. want to have the rest Thank of the conversation. Colin. Uh, sorry, Steve. Sorry, for Colin, for bringing Steve in, but it was just such a wonderful opportunity. But uh, listen, listen Larry, that, from that moment onward, <laughs> I learned more from him than I would have if I hadn't had that experience, and I still do. <laughs> and that's why we've been a profoundly fun partnership. But in one of the things is if I go and show you my kitchen right here, there's a sign in it that says, never miss an opportunity to shut up. <laughs> and that's some wisdom from Steve as well, because he told me, Dad, you talk too much. <laughs> you don't miss so that'll be another bit of advice that I'll give people. Learn from your son to listen better. <laughs> yeah. So, so I want to quickly tell you. So one of the things I've been watching this relationship between the two of you, and it's been a very, um, it's, you know, where it's ended up is for me a, a hopeful. There's a hopefulness for me around. I want to have the, that kind of relationship with my children. And, um, and, and, and then it help, it, your experience has helped me to really take that experience seriously of being focused on what I wanted rather than what they wanted. Um, because I have similar stories, which we're not going to tell now. But the, the beautiful thing is when we realize it as parents, we can, we can course correct. And you course corrected quite hard. You were like down on the N1 or wherever going, traveling to power. And then you, you took a hard left or a hard right. And, um, and, and this led to where you are now. So Colin, could you do a kind of summarized version of what happened then? Yeah. Well, I left SA Breweries because I told you I thought I was going mad. And I became, I started a consultancy business and I sat on a number of boards and one of the advantages of that is that as a consultant or even as a non-executive director, you can't kick butt. You have to be polite. <laughs> so you can't say to a client, you bloody do this or else, because they'll say to you, well, or else is what I've decided. And um, so I learned quite quickly that you had to be more subtle with power. Not that you don't use it, but you have to be quite subtle. And I became quite subtle with power because I thought, well, maybe what I need to do is just to modify the, my use of power. And then one day, and I always wear these things because it makes people laugh, but one day, and I don't remember exactly when it was, I suddenly saw this incredible reality that when my energy was high, I could fly, almost fly. And then when I looked at it another way and saw that when my energy was low, then I couldn't. And so I became interested first and fascinated by this impact of my own energy on my own outcome. Became a student of my own energy and my outcomes and began to realize that it wasn't just a work-related phenomenon, it was a everything phenomenon, that you dance better, eat better, sing better, drive better, sleep better, golf better, write strategic things better. Everything goes better when your energy is high. But when your energy slumps, you can be damn dangerous. In fact, what we'll talk a bit more about that, I would think. But what I learned then, and I've learned very substantially since then, is that the relationship between your energy and your brain and the relationship between your energy and your physiology is a given. <laughs> it's an up and a down and um, Stephen and I decided that we needed to make it simpler because people talk about you know energy high energy low energy passion enthusiasm and all those nice words and so we said let's use the metaphor of a car battery that when your car battery is flat your car doesn't go <laughs> it's as simple as that and it's only a small portion of the cost of the car 
it's just a little battery and it's a little charge. And so we began to be fascinated by this whole challenge of how do you move your energy up? How do you charge your battery? Because when your battery is charged, you are your best. <laughs> so that was the next journey for the next few years while I was doing consulting, while I was on boards. And in fact, while I put Woolworths and Truworths together to make it into World True and subsequently added Massmore. And then I had a different objective as the boss. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to create a high energy organization, not a high power organization. And that organization, funnily enough, was a fascinating power organization because the people in Woolworths were largely family people. The people in Truworths were also largely family people. And family people have a subtle way of using power, believe me. I tried to use it on Steve without subtlety. And they had a, a selfish view. If you talk to Woolworths people, they said the secret of success of, of retail is goods, goods, and goods. If you talk to truers, they say, no, 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 no. The secret of retail is fashion, fashion, and fashion. And then you talk to MassMart and they say, no, no, no. The secret of retailing is price, price, and price. And to get those three attitudes into one boardroom was quite something. But what I was saying to them was the one common thing about all of you is that you retail better if your energy is high. Simple as that. So that's how I brought it into, into World True. <laughs> I was trying to show them that I knew nothing about goods, goods, and goods. I knew nothing about price, price, and price. I knew nothing about, certainly nothing about fashion, fashion, and fashion. But what I did know about was energy, energy, energy. So one of the stories of that time, just um, your, I love your stories. One of the stories of that time, was it Gladys at Cavendish? Yeah. <laughs> Are you willing to share that story? That story? Well, favorite story? Well, let me step back one. What I found was that an individual with a fully charged battery is fantastic. An individual with a flat battery is useless, just about. When you put teams together to make a highly successful team with low energy people is impossible. Low energy people can't make it a team. But the interesting thing is that you can put high energy people together into a team. And you know what? They're not a team. They fight like Kilkenny cats or we say leopards. So what I found was that at Willie's, people disagreed. The people on the seventh floor didn't agree with the people on the fifth and the fourth and the third and so on. And I was different. And I had by then started with Steve programs called the World Two Leadership Program. And I think a reputation spreads quite quickly. And everybody was saying, and who is this funny guy from Joburg who knows nothing about retail and tells us all about energy? And, but I developed some degree of trust, I think, amongst the ordinary people in Woolworths because I was often in the stores and I was listening to them. And this is the, this is the point. Because I knew nothing, I could ask questions. And the first thing I did was to look at the balance sheet. And I can't read a balance sheet for life of money. But I saw a huge item called stock. And I thought, gee, this is a huge sum of money. Do you take stock often? So they said, no, don't be stupid. We never take stock. Couldn't close the store for three days to take stock. The customers would be, revolution, would be revolutionaries. So how did you arrive at that number? So they said, it's a reconciliation. I said, a reconciliation between what and what? And they said, between the head office ledger and the goods received notes. In other words, what we pay for what versus what we get delivered. So I said, do they balance? That was a good question. I was really proud of myself. And then there were embarrass embarrassment around the room because I said, no, it doesn't balance, not quite. Well, what's the balancing factor? So they said the next line and the next line was called shrinkage. <laughs> and shrinkage in that year, 1981 was 140 million. That's more money than a lot of companies were making at that time. That was what we were losing, or we thought we were losing. We assumed you were losing. Cut all of that story short, I was told that one of the guilty parties are the 
cashiers. I said, what are cashiers? How can a cashier take 140 million rands with the Mrs. Ball's chutney home in a handbag? Oh, no, they don't do that. They jump the sensor. Why would you do that? Well, if your mother's standing there or your brother's standing there or your friend's standing there, you do them a favor and you just jump the item over the sensor and it doesn't register and they get a benefit. Ah, that's terrible. What are we going to do about it? So we were going to do some things about it. That's when Gladys came into the picture. It was the Woolworth store in Main Street in Claremont. It's now in Cavendish, but in Main Street. Pardon me, and this young girl comes to me and she says, Mr. Hall, you are the chairman, aren't you? So I said, yes, I am. She said, would you mind if I spoke to you? So I said, not at all, please do. So we went to a quiet spot and she said to me, Mr. Hall, I have just stolen 609 Rand from you. 609 Rand, I'll never forget. 609 Rand in 1981 was quite a lot of money. <clears throat> I said, Gladys, what did you do? She said, well, my uncle came with a full trolley to my cash register and he gave me the eyeball and I jumped 609 rands worth of goods over the sensor without registering them. I said, Gladys, what are we going to do? She said, that's what I've come to speak to you about. Now that's the beginning of wisdom. It's when Gladys puts her finger up and says, that's what I've come to speak to you about. And it's got to do with leadership. I'll come back to that. <laughs> she said, <clears throat> why don't we have a queuing system like they have in the banks. So I said, I don't know what you mean. What do you mean by that? She said, you know, when you go to a bank, you can't choose your teller. You get a number. So I said, well, how would that help? She said, well, then my uncle wouldn't be able to come to my cash register for sure. He might lucky, but he won't be sure. I said, but well, the customer's gonna like that. How would you do it? She said, we would have a queue and we would have numbers. I said, well, the, the customers like it. She says, Mr. Hall, you've got to sit where I sit all day and listen to customers tell you what it's like to choose your queue and think it's going to be a short, fast queue and find that it's some old fool who can't find his money, money or has forgotten something or whatever. She said, it's like tolls, Mr. Hall. When you go to a toll, you want to go through the fast one. And if you get in behind some idiot, you get crossed. We tried it in Bedford View for the first time. And in the first full year, it saved 40 million. Now, the purpose of that story is that only Gladys, out of all the people that I talked to, had enough information and enough guts and enough trust in me to be able to come to me and start that conversation. She's a store manager today, needless to say, but it doesn't matter about that. It's about what is an absolutely fundamental change in leadership. Leadership is not about sitting at the top and seeing where we go. Leadership is about something else. It's about creating an environment in which there's high levels of trust and the ears and the eyes of the organization belong to the organization. That's where it got me to. It's changed it completely. So that's you can't lead funny. from the seventh floor of Woolworths. You've got to lead from the ground floor of Woolworths. So, Colin, what your so this is a continuation of the conversation we had with Ian Fur the other day around leadership that the lead, the kind of leadership that we need in the world today is leaders who know that their job is to serve the Gladyses of this world and to ensure that Gladys can do a fabulous job. And you you don't do that by shouting and telling and using the old ways of power and I think you and I have a shared kind of for some reason I and I, I, I'm still don't understand how that happened is we've both kind of simultaneously came to this using red and blue as ways of describing the difference in terms of management and leadership so can you take us into that kind of red blue model so there are many people on this call who would have been introduced to this um, when they were at part of partners possibility or when they attended a flawless consulting course but it all comes back to this there are it's a choice it's just a choice around how we show up every day and so please talk to us about red and blue and then the I see a, a note came through about psychological safety 
<laughs> that's what we do too much of. We do too much fancy stuff. And that's why the simple book is about red and blue. So again, it's Steve comes into the act. Steve's daughter, my granddaughter, Hannah, was four and she challenged me, I thought, but it was a dream to, to do something about the world that she was going to live in. And I wrote a book called Peoples. And that book's available to all of you. And Yvonne, who was in our chat group, she says she's bought a few. So now we've made it available and it's digital and you can flip the pages. So don't hesitate if you've got young people, but it's also for old people. And very, very simply, it just says that when you behave in this way, that's called blue. And when you behave in that way, that's called red. And in the language of a, of a four-year-old, I said to Hannah, because the, the book ends with this question to ask the young, the young listener, Hannah, what have you done today that was blue? As quick as a wink, she said, I ate all my supper. Now, in four-year-old language, that's a good start. <laughs> and then I took my plate through to the scullery to be washed, and Betty was there, and I thanked Betty. And when I thanked Betty, I looked in Betty's eyes. Is that blue, Papa? Is that blue? Of course it's blue. Then she said to me, ah, and, 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 and. Did you see my feet run through the grass when your car came through the gate and how I hugged you till there were tears in your eyes? Is that blue? Of course it's blue. But the worst part was she said to me, Papa, what did you do today that was blue? And I couldn't think. I couldn't think. Because we don't. <laughs> we don't do enough blue. And so the book is blue and red. And then there was a lovely story, which I want to tell you now, which Steve told me also. He lent the, not lent, gave the book to a family and they read it and they loved it. And it's very easy language because you can say, gee, mum, that was a really, really blue supper. Wow, I enjoyed that supper or whatever. Or I had a blue day at school or whatever. And one of the children is six. Listen to this, she's six. And she stood next to her father four or five times a day. And maybe Steve can tell the story. In fact, let's ask Steve. Are you there, Steve? Steve? Are you there? I'll spotlight him. You are muted, Steve. <clears throat> there you go. Right, come yeah. on. Will you tell the story of that lovely six-year-old? Yeah, amazing. And, and as we all are involved in this uh, incredibly new world of Zoom calls and back-to-back uh, Blue Jeans meeting and Microsoft Teams and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, Stuart was doing the same thing. He runs an insurance business, uh, busy, crazy, crazy times with massive claims, of course, of lockdown. And his six-year-old kept popping into the room and wanting to play. Dad's at home. This is really fantastic. So surely dad's got time. And after seven or eight back-to-back -back meetings and him constantly chasing her out of the room, uh, he then went to go and check on his daughter who turned around on her heel and said, Dad, uh, that was very, very red. If you want to speak to me, you can Zoom me in my room. <laughs> and she didn't even know really what Zoom was at the time. But, you know, that was the impact of that red behavior in the eyes of a six-year-old begets red behavior. Uh, and so too does blue. And uh, so it is a universal kind of thought process and it is it really is a fabulous uh, read for all ages uh, around our own behaviors and around our own perceptions and, yeah, and called, then, then, ask what it was called it's called peoples and um i'm just gonna ask, i'm trying to see whether i can get my daughter's attention to really go and get my copy for me but um yeah it's called people Peter, Peter, um Colin? that's right yeah, and I mean, she went on one step further because she reminded her father when he said that she had also played red when she stamped her feet and slammed the door. And she said, Dad, you must learn that when you play red, you get red back. And in very, very simple terms, I believe that's the, that's the message. If you play red, you get red back. And if you play blue, you get blue back. So we became fascinated by why people play red. And why don't they play blue? And what we were inspired by was a, a quotation from Oscar Wilde, who said, to live is the rarest thing in the world. Most people just exist. I thought that was terrifying, but he's right. And most people, I think, become more people in the consequence of COVID. But there are more people 
who have got flat batteries. There are more people who are just existing. There are more people who just can't get their acts together. And so what we were fascinated by was why do some people come through these things with charged batteries? What have they got that the others haven't got? And that's where Steve's book so rich. Because what it says is there's simple ways to behave that creates energy. That it's about behavior, the way we behave towards ourselves, the way we behave towards others, and the way we behave towards the communities that we live in. And so what drives behaviors, <laughs> we wondered. And we came to this wonderful conclusion from the work of Stephen Covey, for whose franchise or for whose work we were franchised. And he calls it the see, do, get model. And he says, you do what you do because you see what you see. And you get what you get because you did what you did, basically. If you want to change or understand the do, understand the see. So just to give you one example of the six pictures, if I say to you, there's only one version of the truth and I've got it. How does that help you, Louise, <laughs> if you don't agree? We don't agree. We get further and further apart. I use my power, my authority. I insist and we end up with a low energy relationship. If I have another picture which says there might be, there might be a Margaret Wheatley here who's got another view of the future or of the world. Let me listen. So what I think is changing is that people's voices are being heard now. People are saying, listen to me or else. If you don't listen to me, I'm going to write a letter to the newspaper. If you don't listen to me, I'm going to burn tires in the street. If you don't listen to me, I'll just disengage. I'll come to work, I'll earn my money at the end of the month, but I'll do nothing more than that. So that the old system of saying, there's where we're going, you better come with me or else, is absolutely failing. And it's failing, you ask the vice chancellor of the university in Cape Town whether she's the boss, no, she, she got an office back. And you ask the headmaster of one of our leading schools who got a letter of demand from his matric pupils, Ask him who's running the school. And so you can go on. It's not just about authority in the form of corporates or in the form of politics or in the form of police or in the form of anything else. It's also in the form of fathers and mothers in homes. That we are starting to become leaders of our home network in a way that we never were before. We've got responsibilities towards my brother-in-law who lost his job or my parents-in-law who are sick in their old age home. And all those kinds of things have made each one of us a manager of some issues and also a leader in terms of keeping the battery charged. So what I'm excited about is what happens when people realize that if you play blue, your battery gets better. If you play red, it gets a hell of a lot worse. I should stop now because I give you a chance. Well, that's I'm, fine. So lots I'll of people are stop. asking about the book now. So just let's just kind of be clear that at the end of the session, you will receive a, a letter or an email from Colin and Steve. We'll send it to you. Um, and in there will be a, I'm making an assumption, Colin, that you are continuing to be generous with your hamper. Yeah, there's a link to our hamper. Yeah. There will be a link to the hamper and the hamper will then uh, that will, will give you access to this book electronically and then he can also, I'm trying to get my copy and I can't find it. Um, we will also then, um, uh, in, in, the, in, in the hamper is a copy of the book uh, of electronically and, um, and then you can kind of ask all your questions around how do you get more. Um, also want to just, just so that people know, Colin and Steve, um, their organization is called Learn to Lead. They run amazing, amazing workshops on employee engagement. They've luckily influenced a whole bunch of us. So many of us are kind of preaching their wisdom and their, their um, uh, you know, we've been turned into, I, I, I use this words very carefully, disciples of Colin's thinking. I think we've co-created a, a way of thinking about employee engagement and leadership. Uh, which, which is why we are in this conversation together, because we all we agree that certainly the three of us agree that uh, leadership is about influencing other people. It's about power with. It's about moving away from the hierarchy to the circle, and um, and 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 I think what COVID has shown us specifically is the days of 
thinking we can get stuff done through authority and mandate is just long gone. And what we need now is we need to learn to play blue. So Colin, you've got 10, or, let's say 15 more minutes, because then we want to kind of create an opportunity for people to share. But if you had to summarize all of this wisdom about energy and leadership in, in kind of 15 minutes to as a final opportunity for you to share your wisdom, um, and then we're going to invite people to ask their questions. So any well, yeah, having spent half my life enjoying power um, and the other half of my life enjoying energy, um, I want to say a couple of things. The first is that power begets power. Red gets red. And you can get jolly sick and jolly tired of playing power. It's too easy to make a mess of. Energy is quite different. Energy has got some magic capabilities. First of all, energy is free. <laughs> There's no cost attached to energy. You don't go to ATMs and buy it. If you charge your battery, you're away. Nobody stops you and says you, you owe me money for the charge. The second thing is that energy is infectious. And the magic of that is that it's positively infectious as much as, in fact, more than if it's negatively infectious. But as a result of COVID, we've given the negativity the predominance. We all read the newspapers and watch the TV and listen to Trump and all that kind of stuff. And we all get miserable as hell. And then negative energy is all over the place and batteries are flat all over the place. So that the fun of life is that every bit of fun you have boosts the energy. <laughs> every laugh you have boosts the energy. Every person you stop in the street and chat the other day there was a whistle in my little lane here in Newlands a whistle I haven't heard a whistle for years and years and years and so I went out I shouted I said who's that making that noise and you could see as he came around the corner he was just wanting to say another bloody white man telling me not to make a noise in the street but by that time I had already said to him gee I want to thank you I haven't heard anybody whistle in my street for years and years and years. What's your name? He said, Sampiwi. And why do you whistle? He says, because it makes me happy. So I said, Sampiwi, you can come down my street anytime you like whistling. I mean, for the whole day I was whistling. That's my point, right? You can get cross with somebody who doesn't let you into the traffic, but if you try, you can find people who do. I'm old now and when I cross at a zebra crossing, I'm always fascinated by the way that people stop and let me through. But I smiled back. So I'm hugely optimistic about what we can do if we just change the mindset. And leadership is about changing the mindset. It's about seeking the positives. It's about maximizing the contributions of everybody. And not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me exercising some kind of um, authority that is given to me by some statement. And so the exciting thing for me is how do we go from here out of COVID and become nicer people? How do we treat with the environment better? And that's the exciting part. That's what we want to share. And so in the gift hamper, there are three or four gifts. There's Stephen's uh, preview of Stephen's book. There's a four hour video based personal energy journey, which teaches what we were trying to teach on our programs. And don't be put off by the four hours because it's broken down into short videos of three or four minutes each and makes you think about things that we talk about. And then the last thing that, and I think I'll end on this, is, is the 10 minute battery charger. Now, why a 10 minute battery charger? Well, this time last year, I was fighting cancer. And one of the things that I'm convinced of is that you fight cancer, and in fact, you fight anything that invades your body better when your energy is high. If your battery is flat, cancer's, cancer's got a good chance. But if your battery is charged and you've got a team of people around you, you've got high charged batteries, you can give cancer a kick in the teeth. And so what I needed to be sure of was that every day my battery was fully charged. And in the 10 minute battery charger, there are some ideas that you can use together with somebody else or with a journal that will enable you to make sure that you leave home 
whatever that means, or you start your day on a high. And when you start on a high, you give away energy to other people and they give it back. So it's a great start. And that's in that, um, in that gift hamper, which you can have with the greatest of pleasure. So last point that I just wanted to make was a learning that I got, funnily enough, from my second wife. I've done two bad marriages. I messed both up. But anyway, she's a chef. And she taught me the difference between baking and cooking. And in very simple terms, that's precious. Because in everything we do, there's an element of baking. And with baking, there was one right way and 29 wrong ways. <laughs> and the best thing to do is enable people to learn how to do right things right. If that means a little bit of boundaries, a little bit of discipline, it's the best thing that could happen. Because if you don't cook it right, it ends up wrong. Cooking, so if you don't bake it right, it ends up wrong. Cooking is like puiki, and that's got no recipes. You make puiki the way you like puiki. You make puiki the way your friends like puiki, and nobody can tell you you have to put curry in or you have to put red wine in. That's your choice. And so leadership is about, is about cooking. It's about having sensitivity to each individual's particular unique characteristics and enabling yourself or in becoming easier to follow. In a relationship with somebody that you truly understand, you become more and more trustworthy and more and more. And that's why Gladys comes and talks to you. Leaders, listen. Here we go on to questions. Leaders, yeah. listen. So, so, so there's, I just want to kind of make two connections. Again, we, I'm constantly connecting all of the dots uh, the, the, in, in Partners for Possibility and in Symphonia. We now, we've kind of modified that model of the Covey model slightly because we talk about seeing, being, and doing. And it's about being and what you, how you are being for us, Colin, today, authentic and vulnerable, and we can kind of relate to you. For me, that is the model for the kind of leader, even though they are white and tall men, they still have humanity and you are in, you, you kind of presenting that to us today. So thank you for that. Um, and so now what we want to do is we want to create an opportunity for people to share a few things. I want you to uh, ask a question, uh, but simultaneously, I want you to start to think about everything that you've heard so far from Colin. And if you had to go and meet your child or a partner or a colleague uh, uh, 20 minutes from now, and someone said, what was your key takeaway from this call? What would you say to them? And the reason I'm asking you to do that, because we know that adults don't learn from doing, they learn from reflecting on doing. So we want to start you on that kind of opportunity to reflect. Because your gift to Colin, when you say to Colin, here's what I've taken away, it will shift something about how he sees the world. He's coming into the session as a, we, we talk about lead learner. So he's, in my experience, Colin is always curious and interested to hear what other people have to say. So your perspective on this conversation is incredibly useful for us. So please share your thoughts, uh, share your questions. We will now give some opportunity for people to ask questions. Um, and then the other, the other dot I want to connect, Colin, is, is, is I think you and I have a shared love for, for Ben Zander and the art of possibility work. Um, and and we, we really do think that that metaphor of the, of the conductor, that the conductor is the only musician who doesn't make a sound, but he his power is dependent on his ability to make other people powerful. And so every single time we go into a conversation, we have a choice. Am I going to be the energy giver and infectious energy, or am I going to suck the energy out of this life? I met a group the other day and I said, what are you doing this afternoon? They said, oh, we're sitting detention. I said, what do you mean you're sitting detention? We have a management team meeting. And I'm going, no, 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 that's not how we want to live our lives. And this is the role that leaders have to play. So, um, so, so some insights and some wisdom coming into the room. I'm going to ask now that if you want to uh, share your thoughts, to please unmute yourself or put your hand up electronically on Zoom because I can't see everybody. Um, so either unmute or um, show your blue Zoom hand and, 
and um, and then we're going to give you the opportunity to just ask a question. So the first person to speak is Ndoyithile Stephen Miti. Stephen, and just sorry, Ndoyithile, we'd love to hear from you. You are unmuted. You can speak. Thank you very, thank you very much. I, I just posted something on the chat box which says, I realize there is lack of energy in my team and that drags everybody down. A few individuals are very energetic, do their best, but those that do not have the energy or that do not show it, they are dragging everybody down. So it's something that I think I must work on. But uh, the question is, how do I make a start? Where do I start to energize those who are dragging everybody down? One of two things, either go to the camper or come in or contact us and we'd love to help. It's the best thing, it's what we enjoy most. Well, I would say, Colin, I'm gonna say, if I, when, when people ask me that question, I say, so definitely, Colin's hamper is fantastic, but also read this book. The book is called The Art of Possibility from, by Ben and Rosanda. And mm. everything that they have in this book is aligned with, with Colin and Steve's kind of thought thinking um, and then definitely we'll send you the link for the hamper and Colin is an amazing kind of tonic to bring into a, into a conversation to, to see this so you may want to invite him in to kind of do, meet with you. Either of it's called it's called it. Art, Art of Possibility. Art of Possibility by Ben and Rosanda. I have put it in the chat. It is, it will thank change you. your life. So thank you, um, thank so you the, very much. The magic of that book is that it shows you what you didn't ever believe possible, or what energy can do even to the performance of a major classical orchestra. It's amazing. And to watch wow. them is even more amazing. And it's, it's, it's been the kind of fuel that kind of fueled a lot of what we've done through Partners Possibility. So we've touched a million lives. A lot of that came from, from um, Colin thinking, from the Zanders. These are all contributors to this way of thinking. I think a caution though, we need to be careful when, because when people say how, the, the temptation is to give them a simple answer and say, well, you do this and you do that and you do so much of this every morning and you do some meditation. The magic of your battery is that it's your battery and only you can charge it. And we give you tools that help you to find the way to charge your battery not solutions to how batteries should be charged. There's masses of that stuff out there. And it's all about you should do this and you shouldn't do that and you should do this and you shouldn't do that and you should do this and you shouldn't do that. And it's quite rude, some of it, because it's no mask, no entry. But the big trick is to accept that it's your battery and that you need to learn the unique way of charging your battery. That's where we are most excited. I want to just quickly respond to Ramesh's question. So Ramesh says, can you please expand a little on the concept of reconstructive leadership? So Ramesh, the invitation to the session was reconstructing leadership. And essentially what we are saying is we are changing the picture about leadership. The old picture was a leader should know the way and show the way and give direction and do that through power. The new picture of leadership is the leader is a conductor. The leader is the person whose job it is to create a space for every person to make their best contribution. And we do that through playing blue. So we're changing the picture about leadership from that old traditional hierarchical patriarchal way of thinking about leaders to this new way, which is the servant leader, the leader whose job it is to pay attention to the individual people in their teams. Um, I see that um, Steve had um, unmuted himself earlier, so I just want to quickly give an opportunity yeah. to Steve, and then we had someone else as well. Louise, sorry, very quickly, but to just um, uh, send something to Ndoye Sile, Stephen, who asked, you know, how do I energize my team? I think you know, we can go on workshops, we can read books, we can do amazing stuff, but practically, um, just three thoughts came to mind, Ndoye Sile, and the first one is, how do I greet? Um, how do I greet my team? How do I greet people in my team? Do I greet them? Uh, because if we greet, we open the doors to conversation. And if we open the doors to conversation, we can build relationships. Uh, and so there's a practical and absolutely fundamental process that is so important around how we greet. 
and it can lift energy or it can drain energy immediately. The second is listen. <laughs> and again, we can go on courses for six weeks on how to listen properly. But do I give somebody that 37 seconds to really make their point or create eye contact or when I ask them how they are, am I asking them how they are really? And then am I prepared to listen? And the third is share. And sharing, I think, in Doye Sile is when people see your energy and you sharing what raises your energy, they see an example of somebody that's living with a full battery. And so it's not our role to say, this is how you should charge your battery. But when people see you with a charged battery, you're sharing that example and they can learn from you. So on a practical level, I hope that helps. Thank you, Stephen. So definitely people don't listen to what we say as much as they, they watch what we do. Uh, Farouz has Hatta. We'd love to hear from you. Um, you can speak. Hadija, they're calling me, but I don't know how to respond. Okay, so no, I think that was an, an, an accidental um, unmute. So anybody else who has a question or a comment or wants to say something or ask Colin something? Yeah. What's the thing? Hi, Luis, yes. Sorry, I'm, Sorry, I'm just saying, I, there you go. Okay, I'm yes. I accidentally pressed the button. Sorry. Thank you. I wanted to say that I love the way Colin started his story um, about leadership on the seventh floor. And my takeaway um, is that leadership is no longer on the seventh floor, but leadership is actually amongst us, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to also say thank you so much for uh, some of the books that you shared there, because I've also learned a lot from Partners for Possibilities and having to look at life through a different set of lenses. And that's how you actually energize your, your energy or your batteries. And um, I was very privileged to be part of, of, of that program. And I, I got to experience it on, on Saturday, actually, uh, being with the teachers, you know, and being amongst them and being part of them, not isolating yourself just because of you're a leader. And I think the, for me, that's most, the most amazing thing. So as Colin was talking about, you know, um, um, you know, the chess, the monopoly. And I realized that you need to bring your team, you know, into the same space with you and so that they will draw the energy from you and they also spread it amongst themselves and spread it for even further. So those are some of my takeaway and my inputs. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Colin, anything you want to say in response to that? Uh, there's, I mean, there's all sorts of statistical stuff and so on, but there's a word that, they use in corporate world called disengaged. And a disengaged person is a person who's come to work, come to church, come to school, whatever, and has left their energy behind. <laughs> All they've brought is a sandwich and I hope that the day will end quickly. That percentage in corporate life, in churches and in schools has exceeded 90%. That means only one person in 10 is happy to be where they are not having fun and that's terrifying but it's so exciting because what happens if you change those percentages and it's easy it's easy i promise fantastic thank you colin um i'm just trying to get steve so can steve can you just sh show your and um, show your picture again and show that book because you had a copy of the book earlier I just want to want people to see the copy of the book and i'm trying to figure out how to show you how to i'm just going to pin Pin Colin, um, uh, Stephen quickly, and so he's showing his book, Another Set of Lenses. So that's, but but the book isn't available yet in South Africa, but uh, it is available on Amazon and, um, and on, where was it at? Kim, um, Amazon and? Uh, Kindle. Kindle, yeah, Kindle. Okay, thank you very much, um, Colin, uh, Stephen, but please do join us in, for the session that we're going to do with Stephen is going to be um, at the end of May. And if you join our mailing list, we'll let you know what all the other fabulous people you're going to be talking to. So we have eight minutes left. Uh, we want to use this eight minutes in a very particular way. We want to firstly create an opportunity for people to verbalize um, 
not not just do it in the chat, but also verbalize uh, your appreciation for Colin. So just a few people who will look Colin in the eyes and say how much you've appreciated and why you've appreciated being on this call. Uh, we're also going to ask Tasneem will share in the chat um, the link to our feedback form. So please, if you have anything that you want to tell us and you don't want to share it publicly in the chat, because we will also keep a record of the chat uh, messages. But if there's any feedback you want to give us or any kind of thoughts or questions or anything, uh, please, if you could just um, respond to so Tasneem, you're going to just post the link in the chat, yeah? And then people can just um, click on that link. Yes, and then I'm Vanessa, it now. This is a hand up. So Vanessa, we'd love to hear from you. You can just unmute yourself and then David King after Vanessa. Hi, hi, it's Vanessa here. Colin, we it's been lovely to see you again today after so long. Um, it's lovely to hear your and, voice. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Louise, Colin's been a very special part of our small little consulting firm just to get us motivated and back on track. And I think having a session like this while we're all separate in our own home offices and stuff has just been absolute gold. So thank you so much. And we hope to see you in person soon. Bless you. I'd love to. I'd love to. Thank you, Vanessa. Now we're going to ask um, David King. David, just unmute yourself, please. Hi, Colin. Um, I just wanted to, we've obviously, we've never met, but uh, I know of you. Um, I just wanted to thank you for making it, making your, your sharing today so practical. And, and it's always, I, I'm a firm believer in, in storytelling. And by telling stories, we can always relate to what people say. Um, and it's just, for me, it's epitome of, of what wisdom at the end of the day is. So thank you for your, your wisdom. Thank you, David. Oh, you encouraged me to do it more. I've got lots of stories and my book will be out soon too. That's going to be a good read. Thanks, David. Um, let's go to Melissa. Melissa could see her. Melissa, just Hello, Melissa. Hi, Colin. I just wanted to say thank you so much for today to Steve and Louise as well. Um, this has been a wonderful follow-up to the flawless consulting that we had with Louise. And I think right now more than ever, especially with the effects of COVID, we need more energized leaders. So it's been refreshing to just sort of touch base with that and be rerouted in that energy as well. And just hearing your stories just also speaks on, you know, creating spaces that are productive and conducive where a workspace isn't just a place where people work, but it's actually in, in, in essence an extension of your family. Um, so it's just been beautiful to hear from you. Thank you so, so much. Bless you. Thank you, too. Thank you for sticking us out for 90 minutes. Well, and I want to say thank you for Melissa and David and Vanessa, because this is what um, Blue Leadership looks like. They were invited to share their appreciation and they just did it beautifully. And um, I'm sure Colin is going, is leaving this call with more energy than he joined because of your contribution and your appreciation. So Colin, you have the final, I would just want to say, um, stick with us because, because there will be more conversations with Colin. There is a conversation with, with Stephen coming up. Uh, we have a conversation with Professor Jan Jonathan Janssen next week. He's also a dear friend of ours and there will be many more. We have the most amazing community of people in in our wider community and we want to create opportunities for virtual coffees with all of them uh, but Colin on that note you have three minutes to kind of say your final word share your final thoughts with us um, and then we're going to say goodbye sure what a responsibility to fill three minutes on top of what we've already talked about but I think what is exciting to me is that that costs nothing to, to be different. It's as easy to greet somebody as it is not to. It's as easy to wave to somebody in the traffic as it is not to. It's as easy to stop and listen as it is to walk right by. That if what we were saying was, don't do this, don't do that, you must do this, you must do that, just like we're now being confronted in every shop floor and everywhere, you mustn't do this, you mustn't do that, 
And I just want to finish with a little story. I was going into a breakfast room in a hotel in Cape Town in Adderley Street. And there was a delightful young lady at the reception. And I said, good morning. She said, good morning with a lovely smile over her mask. And I said, have you got a table for me? And she said, certainly, sir. How many are you? I said, just one. She said, come with me. So we walked towards the tables and passed the center place where they all serve the, the buffet. And there was one of those horrible yellow signs on the floor that says, Koshan, wet floor. That's a really welcoming piece of information. And what did she do? She put her hand gently on my arm and she said, please, sir, be very careful when we come past here because we wouldn't like you to slip. Now, I go back to that place whenever I can. And I tell the story whenever I can. Why? I went to see the manager. I told him that she was um, delightful and she's been promoted. But that's not the point. The point is <laughs> she made it easy to like that restaurant a please or a thank you or please or be careful. Just little things. It's not about going back to university to get an MBA in new leadership. It's about understanding that you need to make yourself easier to follow. Just make yourself easier to like and not like in a silly way. Like because you feel comfortable. So that's my finishing touch. Just make it a little simpler by paying a little more blue <laughs> and a little less red. So thank you all for joining us today. I, I was excited, as you can imagine, and I'm excited even more so now. I'm on high, bless you. Thanks so much, Louise. Thanks, Steve, for joining us. And thanks, Tasneem, for the background work. Bless you, I'm gonna go and have a jolly good lunch. <laughs> bye now. Thank you. thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Thanks so Bye, much, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. It was very nice much, meeting all of you.